Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. On September 17th of 2010, Pope Benedict XVI walked into Westminster Hall to deliver a speech. And the significance of that moment is difficult to overstate. Because, of course, 500 years earlier, the Church of England had broken off from the Catholic Church. And to have the Pope come here, I don't know that a Pope had ever even walked into Westminster Hall before. And here he is giving this speech. Well, as he gives his speech, he one of the first things that he talks about is Thomas More. And Thomas More uh, uh, was the Lord Chancellor under King Henry VIII for, for a little while. King Henry VIII, of course, is the person responsible for the Church of England breaking away from the Catholic Church. And Thomas More was a vocal opponent to that whole uh, to, to the whole thing. And so the Pope coming and speaking there, referring to Thomas More in that speech, why that was so significant in that moment was not just because Thomas More was opposed to the idea of the Catholic, uh, the Church of England breaking away from the Catholic Church, because in that very hall, almost 500 years earlier, Thomas More was sentenced to death. Uh, and so here the Pope is 500 years earlier giving a speech in this spot where Thomas More had been sentenced to death, and then he begins talking about Thomas More. Thomas More was an incredibly significant person now in just in Western civilization, one of the most respected uh, scholars and statesmen of all time. And as a matter of fact, a, a play was written about him, which later became a movie. And the play, I think, came out in 1960. The movie then came out in 1966. And it was called A Man for All Seasons. And it's about Thomas More. And basically, this, this period of time from about when he became Lord Chancellor, which is in 1529, up until the time he was executed which was about six years later in 1535. Now, the title, A Man for All Seasons, came from something that somebody had said about Thomas More. And Thomas More, I, I want to read this to you. This was a quote that somebody made about Thomas More. And th back in when he was alive, this would have been roughly in the 1520 range when somebody said this or wrote this down. More is a man of an angel's wit and singular learning. I know not his fellow. For where is the man of that gentleness, lowliness, and affability? And, as time requireth, a man of marvelous mirth and pastimes and sometimes of as sad gravity. A man for all seasons. And so here in this description of Thomas More, you get this idea that he's this really humble person. He's a scholar. He's an intellectual. He and yet he's very personable, witty. You know, he he's 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 this kind of man of of variety, and a really special, unique person. And so this play was written about Thomas More about this period of time, where he became the Lord Chancellor, and then and then ultimately was was executed and and so when what was so interesting then is uh, when the pope then standing in the same spot where thomas more had been condemned to death he i want to read you what the what the pope said this is part of the speech that he gave and this is why i think this is so why i wanted to talk about this today because when you hear the term a man for all seasons, at least the way that the person just described him, again, his, the, the way he described him there and the, the man for all seasons is this person of variety, kind of a renaissance man, if you will, which is maybe in its literal sense there. 
but there's more to the meaning that that you realize as you start to understand Thomas More, the situation, and then what the Pope said. So listen to what the Pope said. So here's the Pope, again, in 2010, standing in the place where 500 years earlier, Thomas More had been condemned to death, largely over his unwillingness to support the breaking away of the Church of England uh, from the Catholic Church. And here the Pope is 500 years later. And here's what the Pope said. The fundamental question at stake in Thomas More's trial continues to continue. The fundamental questions at stake in Thomas More's trial continue to present themselves in ever changing terms as new social conditions emerge. And then he goes on. If the moral principles underpinning the democratic process are themselves determined by nothing more solid than social consensus, then the fragility of the process becomes all too evident. And then he goes on, the Pope goes on and talks about how we uh, so often in our culture put these short-term solutions on these complex and ethical problems. But listen to that again. If the moral principles underpinning the democratic process are themselves determined by nothing more solid than social consensus. So when you start looking back at this idea of a man for all seasons and Thomas More and and, and how he says that the fundamental questions at stake in Thomas More's trial continue to present themselves even today, because what the Pope is largely saying there is that you, you, you have to have a foundation. You have to have foundational principles to build something like democracy on top of. And when those principles themselves become, become uh, something that we can change at the whims of democracy, then the whole thing's going to fall down. You have to be able to have certain things, certain principles or or, or a foundation that everything can be built on. And this really then is the fundamental question that that was being faced when, when Thomas More was on trial in the first place. The question is, do we have foundational principles? Do we have things that we can all rely on? Do we have things that the, that the democratic process can be built on top of. Because if, the, if that foundation then can be changed at the whims of society, if that foundation itself then becomes a democratic, becomes part of the democratic process where we can decide whether or not the, the morals themselves are in question. That's when the whole thing becomes, as he puts there, the, it becomes fragile. The fragility of the process becomes all too evident. And so I'm going to read it one more time. If the moral principles underpinning the democratic process are themselves determined by nothing more solid than social consensus. In other words, the idea here is if morality itself is, is flexible if it can be changed by just uh, by by the whims of society then the whole thing uh as he puts there the process the the fragility of the process becomes all too evident so so getting back to thomas more and this is this is so fascinating because when when he then was condemned to die in that very hall that the Pope is standing in after his condemnation. And they do this in the, in the play and in the movie. And we have his words, you know, what Thomas More said, but what's interesting is, and the way they depict it in the movie is so great because when they're about to sentence him after they've said he's guilty, when they're about to sentence him in the movie, Thomas More stops them and says, uh, when, when I've been in here before, the person who's been condemned gets to say something before he's sentenced. 
And they said, well, do you have something you want to stay? And he says, yeah. And this is by many people considered maybe the most powerful part in this movie because he stands and he gives this little speech. And, and rather than in that moment, rather than pleading for, for mercy, here he is in this moment of condemnation when, when his life is on the line. Rather than pleading for some sort of mercy, he stands and he speaks truth. And, 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 and uh, to paraphrase what he says at the end of this little speech, it's so powerful. He, said, he basically said, you have sought my blood because I would not bend. They condemned him basically because he was so solid in his convictions. And so when you talk about this whole idea of a man for all seasons, there's a whole new level of meaning that comes to something like that. Because it's basically, no matter what the season is, he is consistent. You know what he's going to do. You know what he's going to say. You know what his principles are. Because there is a foundation. There is a foundation there that everything's built upon. Now, this is, this is why this is so important. I wanted to talk about this because when the Pope comes and talks about this, he's talking about it in these broad terms. The question from that we were facing at the time of Thomas More, still, we still face this today because we have to ask ourselves, what are these, what are these moral principles that everything's built on? And do we have moral principles that everything's built on? We need that foundation if this is going to work. But you can take that same concept then and apply it down to an individual. And so even though that speech is probably, for many people, the most powerful part in the movie, to me, the powerful thing happens right before it. And I want to share this with you. If you can, so you can remember, if you haven't seen it, what happens here. So Richard Rich comes in and he then, uh, so, so they're having the trial of Thomas More. And Richard Rich comes in and he testifies of a meeting or an interaction that he'd had with Thomas More. And he tells kind of the truth and then he twists it into a lie. Now, this is, this is why this is so powerful. So after he tells this lie, Thomas More is sitting there. And it's so great in the movie how this happens. And if you haven't seen it, you should go watch it. You can find it on YouTube. He, he tells this untruth. And Thomas More stands up. And he says, now I will take an oath. Because see, he wasn't willing to take the oaths that everybody wanted him to about the Church of England and the King's supremacy, etc. But he stands up and he says, Thomas More does, after Richard Rich gives this false testimony. Thomas More stands up and he says, now I will take an oath. If what Master Rich has said is true, I pray I may never see God in the face, which I would not say were it otherwise for anything on earth and the prosecutor shouts that is not evidence and Thomas More said is it probable and he goes on to basically say would I make that statement would I make that oath here right now after all this time after everything you know about me would I make that statement if it were not true would I and it's that powerful moment because, because Thomas More, everybody knew who he was. Everybody knew what he believed because he had been stable and consistent through his life. Everybody knew he was a man of integrity. Everybody knew his foundational principles. And at that moment, to be able to stand up and say, if what he said is true, how did he put that? 
If what Master Rich has said is true, I pray I may never see God in the face, which I would not say were it otherwise for anything on earth. And everybody knew it. Everybody knew that what he said at that moment was true because they knew what to expect from him. Because he had himself built a foundation. They knew who he was. They knew his beliefs. They knew his consistency in them. He was a man of stability. And so when we talk about a man of all seasons, it's an interesting idea because it is more than just a man of diversity. It's also a man that no matter what the weather is like, so to speak, I have a set of principles that I live by, period. And all the other things that go on in my life revolve around those principles. And when he made that comment in the movie, it was beautiful because it's you you realize everybody in that room at that room in that moment knows that he's innocent because he said something and everybody knew because of his principles because of who he was everybody knew that he was telling the truth at that moment powerful amazing stuff but the idea there that i wanted to, to that, that i wanted to draw draw on or or the point i wanted to make is that while the Pope talks about him in these broad principles that as a society we have to have foundational principles that we all understand, a democracy a democracy can only function if there is a set of foundational morals and principles, things that we all have in common, right and wrong that we all understand. Rules, if you will. They have to be there. There has to be this foundational principle of ideas, guides, morality. That's, that's the best word for it. A, a, a foundational set of principles and morals that we all govern ourselves by that everything else can stand on top of. But you take that same thing and you apply it down to a, an individual, a person. As a person, like Thomas More, it wasn't just the principles and foundational morality of society. It was that he himself had lived with a set of guidelines and principles and morality that he was not going to budge from. And it cost him his life. And it also made him one of the most significant people in Western culture. And as a matter of fact, he was uh, uh, under Pope John Paul. He was then... Um, in, in the early 2000s, I, he was, uh, he, 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 let's see here, in 1935, that's what it was. In 1935, he was canonized as a martyr. And in the year 2000, Pope John Paul made him the patron saint of statesmen and politicians. Okay, now, where am I going with all this stuff? I'm, I keep babbling on. In, in 1962, this was before the movie had been made. This is when it was just a play. Robert Bolt, the, the author of the play, A Man for All Seasons, wrote this interesting little article. And I, I wanted to read this to you because it ties all this stuff together. I think this is so important. Because it brought up this idea to me as I'm thinking about this whole idea of A Man for All Seasons. I, I, I had a, it reminds me of something, before I read this, it reminds me of something that, that happened to me many, many years ago. Before my leg injuries that I've had, uh, I, I was a very consistent runner. I've had to modify my exercise because of some leg injuries, but I had this commitment that I was going to get up on certain days and run no matter what. That was just part of my, one of the things I did. I made these commitments to myself. And I remember, I, there's this one morning that sticks out to me, and it was so, I, I, I still remember this morning. I woke up at my whatever time it was, it was around 5, 5.30 to go outside and run. I had this schedule that I would keep, that I committed to myself I was going to do. And I, I woke up, whatever it was, 5.30 in the morning, and I, I look out the window and it had snowed all night. And there must have been 12 inches of snow out on the sidewalks. And I thought, well, and I, <laughs> I looked back at the bed and I wanted so badly at that moment to think, I mean, come on. 
I know I said that I was going to run on this day, but I mean, it snowed outside and it's just there's all this snow. How am I going to possibly? And I remember having this little battle in my mind go, did I commit to do it or didn't I? Did I commit to do it or didn't I? I didn't commit to do it as long as it was sunny and nice out. I committed to do it. And it's this whole idea, I, I, for me personally, it's kind of an interesting thought, a man for all seasons. I didn't say that I'd do it when it was convenient. I just said that I would do it. And so I, I, that morning, I still remember that day. I put on, I bundled up pretty seriously. And I went outside and I went running. And I did my normal, whatever it was, three or four miles, whatever I used to do at that time. And I came back and I thought, that's, I did it. I did it. I did it because I said that I would do it. I didn't put conditions on it. I said that I would do it. So I did it. I didn't say that I wouldn't do it in the snow. (laughs) So I did it anyway. It might've been crazy, but I did it. And it's this, and it's this idea here that man for all seasons thing, where if you say you're going to do something, you do it. So, uh, Robert Bolt wrote this article and it's so interesting because it's called, it will pass. And he wrote this again in 62. This is a a couple years after the play, uh, a man for all seasons came out and here's what he wrote. A young King said to a holy man in adversity, I become half hearted about myself and behave weakly. On the other hand, when I have success, I am so filled with self-confidence that I become careless and make silly mistakes. Write me a book which will cure me of these faults and I will read it every day. The holy man answered, there's no need for a book. Give me that ring you're wearing and I will scratch on it three words which will comfort you at a time of adversity and temper you at a time of success. He scratched in the metal. It will pass. I've forgotten where I picked, uh, first picked up this anecdote, but I like it now even better than I did then. I like the young king who knew, I like the young king who knew so much about himself and the holy man who answered him so dryly. I like the extraordinary seesaw that his three words start, success and failure, both of short durations. Both unimportant then? No. But neither important enough to knock you off your balance. What holds the balance is that both are brief. I I, I saw this as a side note. I saw this video a while ago with Tom Hanks. He was sitting at a table with a bunch of other really famous actors. And he said something that he wished he had learned earlier in his life was the words, this too shall pass. And then he said, when you have when you're really down and you have these awful things happening and, you, and you're struggling and he says, this too shall pass. You have to remember that. And then Tom Hanks went on and said, and in those moments where you have success and everything's wonderful and it couldn't get better and life is great and things are moving, this too shall pass. And that's really what this, this article here is about. And he goes on and he says, failure passes, success passes. The holy man passes, the king passes. And then he puts in quotes, none of it's as important as you're making it. The holy man seems to be telling him. But something must have been important to the holy man or he wouldn't have been bothered to be holy. Don't take yourself so seriously, he seems to be saying. But remember, he's talking to a serious man. I doubt he'd have ever said it to a man he thought silly. For he's inviting the young king to that last degree of seriousness, which makes people lighthearted. Really serious people are always light, lighthearted, just as carefully grave and pompous people are usually trivial. The serious, lighthearted people have found that something in their lives, which the serious, lighthearted people have found that something in their lives, which does not pass, which gives them the wisdom to cope with things that do pass. It is a wonderful thing, but it takes some finding. When I talk in this show every day, uh, I I frequently bring up the word commitment. And my personal idea, uh, definition for commitment is following through with a decision even when you don't feel like it anymore. And this really is the overriding principle here. 
you look back at somebody like Thomas More, and he was committed to principles. And when somebody is about to take your life, you've been condemned to death, you probably really don't feel like following those principles in that moment. But that's what commitment is. It's the idea that even when I don't feel like it, it's easy to be committed to things when it's easy to follow through. The reason we have an idea like commitment is because it frequently isn't easy to follow through. And that's why commitment is important. Commitment comes in in those moments when the emotions and feelings are gone. And we're frequently told to make, you hear people like Tony Robbins and others, they'll say that we want to get you into this emotional state so that you will make the commitment. And that's true. It, when you can get yourself emotionally charged up to make a commitment, it helps you make a commitment. The problem is that is a terrible foundation to build something on. And that really is the idea here. When the Pope talks about this, we so often uh, will we'll put these short-term solutions on long-term problems because we throw our emotions at things. Emotions are not a foundation. You cannot build anything on top of an emotion. There has to be something stronger and underlying. The emotions are great for getting you to do things, getting you to start, getting you to move, but emotions are fleeting. And you don't have the ability to hold on to them for long periods of time. Those emotions, you, you get tired of them. They wear you out. And eventually the emotions will fade away. What do you have left at that point? You have a foundation of principles that you have committed to. And the idea behind commitment is that that has to be the thing that fills in the blanks when the feeling is gone, when the emotions are gone, what is left? It's commitment. It's a commitment to foundational principles. And when you go back and listen to what, what the Pope said, I thought this was, his, the speech was so brilliant. The fundamental questions at stake in Thomas More's trial continue to present themselves in ever-changing terms as new social conditions emerge. The world changes. Things are modifying and adjusting and moving and changing all the time. The only way they survive, the only way that we survive, if the moral principles underpinning, underpinning the democratic process are themselves determined by nothing more solid than social consensus, then the fragility of the process becomes all too evident. You have to have a foundation to build everything on that's more than just emo- more than just your feelings you have to have it on a broad sense for a society and you have to have it like thomas more on a personal level where those foundational principles your own personal morality is what your life is built on. And you have the commitment to stick to them, especially when you don't feel like it. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today.